Good Monday morning, Pastor Rob here. Hope everybody had a great weekend. Hope everybody's doing good. Um, today, we're having coffee with my Deals Gap coffee mug. We did a Bible study from Deals Gap on Mark. Uh, and I took the uh, tail of the dragon up to the top and back. Uh, ride my Harley up there. Ride my, took my truck down there. It's a great place to ride if you're uh, looking for a place to ride. Some great scenery and a challenge. Uh, Deals Gap is a great place to ride your motorcycle or take your slingshot or your sports car. Or I'd say if you're really ambitious, throw on a rucksack and hump it up and hump it back. That'll be a good workout for your legs. And beautiful atmosphere. If you don't get hit, I mean, there's, geez, what guys, people drive crazy up there too. Actually, I saw a crash while we were up there. One of the guys hit the guardrail and took the whole front end out of his car. So maybe hiking ain't the best idea, but anyway, if you could, it would be a great hike. So today is Mar we're in Mark chapter 10 again. I love this story here because it's very applicable to today. There's a lot of things in here that happen in Mark chapter 10. We're talking about the healing of the blind man. A couple of things to look at. Um, there's a, some people believe there's a contradiction of scripture here because Matthew talks about two blind men and Luke and Mark talk about one blind man. We'll, we'll, we'll look at that. Um, and just secondly, just the, the healing of the blind man. But certainly, one of the things that I think a lot of us forget that we can do as believers is ask Jesus for things. It's okay. Number one, we should always be grateful for what we already have. Uh, James is very specific that the things that we ask for should be for the kingdom, for the greater good. Um, things like that, not to just uh, give me a million dollars. You know, hey, you can ask for that if you want. Hopefully, you get it. But, but it's really about praying for others, praying for healing, praying for the church, praying for the nation, praying for the world. Um, I think that's where we're more uh, likely to get an answer from. But anyway, just like this study today, uh, we'll see some applications here to current times. So we're going to be in Mark chapter ten. This is our thirty-eighth lesson in Mark. And um, let's take a look at this. So Mark chapter 10, verse 46, it says, Then they came to Jericho. Uh, Jesus and his disciples were together with a large crowd. Of course, we know that he has fed somewhere between five and 20,000 people in the last couple chapters. So he's got a large crowd. Well, how large this crowd is, I have no idea. It just says large crowd. And it says, um, They came to Jericho, and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city that's going to be key and a blind man blind Bartimaeus he's named specifically so this man is well known in this town or they have met him after the fact but certainly they have his name recorded here blind Bartimaeus this is the son of Timaeus very specific not only do they know the man but they know his father son of Timaeus now uh, he was sitting at the roadside begging no surprise this was common back then the beggars and we still have that today this is what I love about the Bible is you would say, well, that was back in the day. But if you go to Walmart here where we live, there's people sitting all over the parking lot. If you go to Chick-fil-A, sitting all over the parking lot, begging, asking for food, asking for money. I don't know where the uh, will work for food signs have gone. Those are gone. But uh, basically, a lot of people are asking for handouts. And we give quite a bit. We'll buy meals for people. And I really enjoy doing that, actually. So, um, so this is nothing uncommon. Jesus is very popular. He's preaching. He's teaching. He's got a crowd. He's headed to Jericho. Um, he goes through Jericho, and that's going to be key, too, when we look at the, the uh, contradiction, quote-unquote, that people believe is here. Uh, and uh, blind Bartimaeus approaches him as he's leaving the city, and uh, he gets healed. So when he heard that Jesus of Nazareth was in town, he began to shout. So how did this? Did, how did a blind man know Jesus was coming? He hears the crowd. So he's very uh, in tune with his environment, as blind people are. They hear a lot of things. I had a friend named Dave who was blind. He was really, really uh, sharp when it came to things being said, things happening in a room. Very, It was amazing, actually, how he had like a radar hearing, man. If something happened, he heard it. And he would be like, what was that? Or I heard this, or I know, or he would know what it was sometimes, even not being able to see. So uh, how did a blind man know Jesus was coming? He heard the crowd coming. There's a large crowd. Jesus is popular. And this would be very easy for a blind man to pick up. Something's different. And so he asked, what's going on? The people said, Jesus of Nazareth is coming. Now he gets excited. 
great for him. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Son of David, have mercy on me. This man knows who Jesus is. This is all the way back to 2 Samuel. This is the this is the uh, the, the king, the, the son of the king, uh, fleshly king, the line of uh, David. Jesus is from the line of David. He's from the royal line. And so he says, son of David, have mercy on me. And people rebuked him. Be quiet, be quiet. This was probably from the procession as I was studying this. It looked like people from the procession were saying, hold it down, hold it down. You know, don't, don't disturb the master. And this happens quite a bit in the Bible. But I want to say this, that people say, um, don't pray. Just give up. The Bible's worthless. Jesus never hears you. I'm going to say just the opposite. Stay the course. Stay persistent. Keep praying. Don't give up. I'm going to show you how this pays off for him. And I'm going to ask, how many of you today have dreams? And people are like, ah, oh, that's worthless. Forget about your dream. Don't do that. There's always skeptics. Always skeptics. They're, they're, they're out everywhere. And they love to just point fingers and shoot you down. If you're a dreamer, if you're a hard worker, if you're a person going for an education, go for it. If you have a dream, don't let anybody hinder you from your dream. There's always going to be naysayers. There's always going to be resistance. But if you're focused and if you believe in what you're doing, go for it. Don't let anybody stop you. And specifically, if somebody's trying to stop you from going to Christ or praying for a loved one, praying for a dream, praying for an answer, don't let anybody stop you. Keep going. And I was just asking you, how bad do you want it? How bad do you really want the answer to your prayer? How bad do you really want your goal? Don't let anybody tell you, be quiet, stop, don't do this. Because this is what happens to blind Bartimaeus. A blind man hears it. He knows Jesus is coming. And he says, Son of David, have mercy on me. People try to quiet him down. And he says even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. But he shouted all the more. If somebody's trying to stop you, try all the harder. I mean, if you watch football all weekend, when you run up to that goal line, you're trying to score a touchdown. And they've got a goal line defense. And you got 11 guys coming at you. And you want to score that touchdown. What do you do? When you hit that line, and I played football, you put your head down, you put your shoulder down, you get you get low, and you push with your legs even harder to bust through and get that touchdown for, for your team. So anyway, that's just, just an example. But certainly dig in. Dig in harder. Go out and fight for what you believe in. Uh, get closer to your Lord. Get deeper into your Bible study. Get deeper into your prayer life. Don't let anybody distract you from getting closer to your Lord. And blind Bartimaeus wouldn't take no for an answer. Be quiet. Be quiet. We don't. He don't want to hear you. Yes, he does. Have no doubt that God wants to hear from his children. And so let's look at this. Yeah, so the people say, uh, Jesus, excuse me, blind Bartimaeus says, Son of David, have mercy on me. Many, many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more. He believed and he knew and he had faith in Christ that if I can just get to Jesus, I can get my sight. So he dug in all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped. So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this is covered. Um, in Matthew 20 and in Luke 18, the same account is covered. Um, and I love that, that in all three accounts, as he's yelling out to Christ, Jesus stops. Now, I was just looking at that, and I thought, how amazing is that, that the God of the universe says, if you pray, I'll stop what I'm doing, and I'll listen. And even in life today, when you think about it, you walk into a room with your mom or dad, or you want to talk to one of your children, and uh, you just, they're, they're doing something. Maybe they're doing homework, they're, they're you know, playing a video game, or on their phone. I mean, there's one for you. This wasn't the case in this day. There was no technology back then. But certainly when they're on their phone, isn't it a great feeling? I want you to think about this. You walk in to talk to your mom, you walk in to talk to your dad, and they're working or they're entrenched in something and they drop everything they're doing and say, oh, what do you need? Isn't that a great feeling when you have the opportunity to see? You're like, wow, I'm that important. Mom and dad dropped everything they were doing to talk to me. Or moms and dads, you walk into a room, you got some kids over and they're all gaming and you need to talk to your child about something important. Maybe you got to go out for a minute and you stop in, you try to talk to the kids, but they don't stop gaming. So it just like, it doesn't mean anything. But doesn't it mean something when you walk in the room and the kids drop everything they're doing, pause the game, and turn and look at you and block out everything and say, yeah, mom, yeah, dad, what's up? And they listen intently to what you're saying. And for me, it's the phone. 
I hate when I go to talk to somebody and they stay on their phone. Yeah, what do you want? Yeah, okay, yeah, I got you, no problem. When my kids walk in the room, the first thing I do is shut my phone down, set it down, listen. And one of the things that I did as a pastor at a church, I love kids. Kids are awesome, man. Kids are the heart of the kingdom of God. They are fun. When, what I learned from an older pastor, he says, what you do when kids walk in, you get down on a knee, you get down on their level. Don't talk over the children. Pastors, if you're listening, anybody's listening to me, who knows? Don't talk over. Don't look down. Oh, hey, little guy, how you doing? That's fine. That's nice. But get down on one knee. And the thing that I did was I kept candy in my pocket or I, I had a jar. The kids all knew it after 12 years of being at the church. I'd hand them a Reese cup or I'd hand them a, a, a sucker. And on social media, I'd keep in touch with what the kids were doing. If they did something special at school, um, my buddy Cy, he would win a wrestling match. Or if they had a birthday, I'd bring them something special. But when they came to the church, I would stop what I was doing. I would get down on a knee. I'd look them eye to eye with the kids. And I would say, hey, I heard you did this. I heard you did that. And I would give them something special and welcome them to church for that Sunday morning. So anyway, drop all you're doing. If, you're, if your parents come in a room, drop all you're doing. Give your parents the respect and talk to them and drop all you're doing and talk intently. And then get back on your phone. It ain't going nowhere. It'll be there. The internet's not going nowhere. It'll be there when you get there. But stop what you're doing and engage in conversation. And then go back to what you're doing when the conversation's over. So I just like this that Jesus did that. It's a great example, even to today. He stopped what he was doing. He's popular. He's powerful. He's in the crowd. He stops what he's doing. And he takes a moment for a blind man shouting out to him. And this would be, uh, this would be kind of unusual. Well, not his day probably, but, but the shouting and the disruption. And Jesus stops what he's doing. So when you pray, God stops what he's doing. God, I have a problem. And this is what I really like is that if you're going to stop God and he asks you, what do you want? And hits what he's doing as a child. Look at God as your father. God, use your name. God, it's, it's Jamie. God, it's Chris. God, it's Mark. I do it. God, it's just, it's Rob. Sometimes I call myself Bobby, but God, it's Bobby. Can I talk to you just for a minute? Be specific. Tell them what you're thinking. Kids, when you talk to your parents and they stop all they're doing, be specific, be professional. Tell them what you're thinking. Go to the point. <clears throat> And, and get an answer. And that's what happens here. Jesus stops what he's doing and he does this. So it says, Jesus stopped. And he said, call him. So they bring the man over. Actually, if you look at if, uh, Matthew and Luke, they brought the man to Jesus. So they called to the blind man, cheer up and on your feet. So now they're all excited. Hey, he's going to stop and talk to this man. He's Now he's got support. Before he had um, he had opposition. Now he's got support because Jesus is like, bring this man to me. He's calling to you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Now, we know, and the other account, it says that they lifted him up. So, of course, he's going to jump up. People were helping him. You know, when there's usually a blind person or somebody there to help them, helps him to his feet, and he came to Jesus. And Jesus says specifically, and he's saying this to each one of us today, what do you want me to do for you? Be specific. This is Jamie. This is Mark. This is, this is Lily. Hey. Jesus, I was thinking about this. I'm getting ready to graduate high school. I don't know what to do with my life. Can you give me some direction? I got a parent in the hospital. I got a child in the hospital. Will you heal my child? Now, I don't know how he's going to answer your prayer, but I do know this. You have God's attention. And so this is what he says. What do you want me to do for you? He, and the blind man said, I want to see. Very quickly, I want to see. Four words. And Jesus says, go. Your faith has healed you. So you know this. This is a prime example. If you're praying, if you have an issue, if you have a problem and you pray, God stops what he's doing and he's listening to you. And pastors, we should do the same thing. I mean, I took phone calls. My church yelled at me a couple of times. Why are you taking phone calls at one in the morning? Well, because if somebody needs me, I'm picking up the phone. Not the greatest for pastoral life, health and welfare, but... And there was a time later on when I had to stop around 6, 7 o'clock because I'm, you know, I'm getting older and it's not good for your health. But literally, God doesn't get old. God doesn't age. So he's ready to answer your questions anytime. So if you get a, if you get a prayer or an idea at 3 in the morning, which sometimes happens to me. I don't know why. I get up at 3 in the morning and I read my Bible. Pray. Ask God. He's listening. He's going to stop what he's doing. Be specific. Tell him what you're looking for. Tell him what you're, and, and you get an answer. So I like that. I wrote this down. I highlighted it. I keep little notes, just little notes. Jesus stopped. 
And I love that. All three accounts, Jesus stopped. Now, there's a contradiction here that people will say is a contradiction. It's not. But in Matthew 20, it says two blind men got up. So what you're going to notice between Luke, Matthew, and Mark is that at one point, Jesus is approaching Jericho, and one man gets up. And then Jesus is leaving Jericho, and two men get up. So they're going to say, see, look at this account. There's one man here and two men here. This can't be right. Even if it is, you know, if number one, if he's coming in and he meets one or two and he goes out and he sees one or two, that's that's fine. But oftentimes, um, based on eyewitness accounts, some people will be more specific than others. But certainly the point isn't that there was one or two men. The point is that Jesus stopped what he was doing, heard the man's prayer, and healed him. Now, on that point, ask. We have to ask. God isn't just going to jump into your life and intervene. And he, he just... So anyway, just keep that in mind. What do you want? Be specific. I wrote these thoughts down. I was reading this. What I noticed in this point was that Bartimaeus was specific. I want to see. We need to do the same thing. Um, uh, be specific. Be specific in prayer. And um, this is one of the things that I was looking at. Uh, we, have, we have a lot of problems in this country. And I've got to ask the people, do we ask God to heal us? So this is the thing, though. If you notice, when Brian Bartimaeus asked Jesus to be healed, Jesus healed him immediately. And this was the 36th time that the, the book of Mark said, Uthios, immediately. Remember I said that, that word is in the book of Mark quite a bit. Immediately he received his sight. Imagine what we could do as a nation if we came to Christ and said, God, we're hurting. And the key here is that when he got when he got his answer, he followed Jesus Christ. He didn't say, okay, bye, I'm going back to do what I do. He followed Jesus Christ. His prayer was answered. As a nation, as a family, as a person, as an individual, when we come to Jesus and we ask for healing, we ask for an answer to prayer, we ask for help with a problem, there was some repentance here. He didn't go about his business. He went back. And so when we pray for our nation, God, heal our nation. I know a lot of people today are praying for that. Look at the crazy, nutty things going on in this country. Anyway, keep praying. But this is the key, is that we can't, God is not going to heal a nation that's going to continue to go its own direction and sin. He's going to say, I'll heal you, but follow me. There needs to be repentance in America. There needs to be a turning of direction in America, in the heart of the country in the heart of your family, in the heart of the church, in the heart of the individual. If we're going to ask God for help, we have to be prepared from that point on to follow God under his wing of protection, under his provision, under his word, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, then to continue to live our life. Not He's not going to heal a nation that's going to say, heal us, protect us, look out for us, provide for us, and then we're going to go sin even more. Not going to happen. I don't think those prayers are going to be answered. Maybe in little uh, areas, specific areas, we might get some healing because those areas are repenting of their sin. But if you're going to continue to sin and ask for God's help, uh, you're not most. I'm not going to. I'm not going to speak for God. But anyway, I would say just based on what we have in the Bible, you may not get an answer to those prayers because He knows if I heal you, if I make you richer, if I make, if I give you that answer, you're going to go on and sin even worse. That Jesus didn't want that. He says, I'll heal you, but go and sin no more. So we need to look at that. And so I was just watching the news this morning, and I noticed that there's a lawsuit uh, in Oklahoma. <clears throat> we have had school shootings, and I hate these things. I, I look at the, the biggest cowards are in the world are people that walk into a school and shoot harmless, innocent children. You're a coward. You're a punk if you do that. I'm sorry I'm talking tough on that. Anyway. That's the way I feel. And I'm glad there's guys out there that, that are resource officers in our schools protecting our children because those guys are cowardly. You got no guts. You went and prayed on a bunch of babies. So um, we want healing. We want those things to stop. And we can ask God to stop. God, please protect our schools. But you can't be like a school in Oklahoma that's suing the town and saying, we're not going to put the Bible in the school but we, want, we don't want any school shootings. We don't want, I mean, God, I don't want any school shootings either, regardless. But if you're going to pray and ask for God to come and heal your school, to heal your nation and your town, and then say, well, we're not going to preach the Bible, how can we expect God to, we don't want you here. 
We just want the benefits of you passing through. We got to look at that and really think about that. Now, God is merciful. God is love. God, not, God does not have any glory whatsoever in the pain that we experience in those instances. And I, my heart goes out to people that have experienced that. But we cannot ask for God's help and then reject God at every level. It's just not, it's just not going to work that way. So I just thought of that. They want to keep the Bible out of schools, but we want to have a perfect environment. You better teach the Bible. You better teach love your neighbor. You better teach respect your parents. You better teach the Ten Commandments. Don't kill, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal. What's wrong with that? You don't want that. And who invented that? God. He doesn't want that for us either. This is our time. We're in time. God gave us rules to enjoy our short time on this earth. If we obey them, I guarantee you our life will be a lot better. If we reject them, then we reject God. And he's not going to just jump down here and make everybody happy. If we follow him, things could change very quickly. So I just thought, how can you expect school violence to stop when you reject the, the God of peace, when you reject the God of the Bible, the God of love, the creator of life? You reject him, but yet we want all these things to be hunky-dory. Don't blame God when bad things happen if you've rejected God. So just keep that in mind. So anyway, that's just one of the things I was thinking of <clears throat> looking at this. Remember in, in Matthew, there's two blind men. He's leaving Jericho. And Luke and that, he's approaching Jericho. There's one and two men. There's no controversy there, no contradiction. Um, and just be specific when you pray. Be specific when you pray. When you talk to God, be specific. God, having a rough day. I need some help. Maybe God, maybe somebody ahead of you at the Starbucks line will pay for your coffee. I don't know. I'm just saying sometimes little things like that go a long way when you're having a rough day. Maybe you could be the person that buys the coffee wherever you're at and uh, or just pays for a meal. We do that a lot. We'll just at throw, we'll see people pray at a table. We'll see somebody we know from church or somebody from the neighborhood and we'll just pick up their check and walk out. They don't even know who it is, but we know that it makes a difference and you hear them talk about it later. You know, you never tell them what's you, but anyway, you can brighten somebody's day by just being God to somebody, being generous. So anyway, be persistent in your prayers. Be persistent in your dreams. Don't let anyone distract you from following your Savior. Trust me, in the long run, that's going to pay dividends. And you'll find out, as I have along the way, I've not always been the perfect Christian. I'm a sinner saved by grace like everybody else. I still sometimes get angry. I still flesh out once in a while. You know, you have a rough day. But I notice the more consistent I am, I see you know, friends, and we all get together, and we start serving God. People I never thought would serve God just because you did the right thing. You didn't let anybody distract you from following your God. Your friends, your family, people will see that it's it's contagious. And who do they come to when there is a problem? Think about it. If you're that Christian, who do they come to when they need a prayer? They come to you. Why? Because they know, or at least they think, you have a line to God. And I would say, I think I have a line to God. I pray. You know, I pray hard. Um, I think my, my, my answer to that when people say, does God really hear my prayer? As I say this, I think the most powerful prayer on the planet today is a mother who prays for her family. I've always believed that. I, I don't think God rejects any man or anything like that, but I really believe moms pray for your families because I think moms just have a special place in the heart of God and that he hears your prayer. Pray for your family, pray for your husband, and you can be that prayer warrior for your family and then lead your family. Men, lead your family, that's your job. Lead your family, protect your family, provide for your family, honor your wife so your children see that. Uh, it's often said that a, a, a girl, if you have a daughter, is going to look for a man who treats her the way she sees her father treat her mother. So if you respect your mom, uh, your wife, the, the daughter sees that, and then she will accept nothing less from the man that she sees. If you want her to find a good man, that's the way to do it. And men, be protectors. Your boys are watching you too. They're going to emulate you. So be strong, be persistent, stay strong. This life ain't perfect. There's a lot of pain in this life and you're never going to be perfect. I always pray for the mistakes I make as a parent. But listen, please, if you're, even if you make mistakes as a parent, they're not as bad. If your kids know they're loved, they're cared for, they're respected and you care for them. If you make a mistake, it's not so bad because your kids are content. Uh, they're established. Uh, they're, they're, um, how do you use the word? I'm not, I forget what the word is, but <clears throat> if you love your kids 
and you spend time with your kids. If you make a mistake, it's not as bad as it is if you ignore them. So um, be an engaged parent. Talk to your kid. Get on their level. Drop what you're doing. Drop your phone, just like Jesus does. He stopped. He listened, and he answered. We can do the same thing as parents today, so make a difference that way. Anyway, everybody have a great day. Thank you for the response. Please subscribe. I'd love to get over 1,000 or 10,000. I was praying today. I said, Lord, I'd like to be the largest Bible study on YouTube. I think that would be awesome. So anyway, let's have a great day, and I will see you guys tomorrow. See you.